Ireland's attachment to the Catholic Church is straining to breaking point. The secret crimes of Irish priests against children have collapsed the church's moral authority. I should be out playing with other 10-year-olds, but I wasn't. I was being taken down the reach and raped. Once the bastion of Catholicism on the edge of Europe, successive state inquiries on clerical abuse have revealed ugly secrets and left the church reeling. I don't know of any other situation that I'm aware of where the, the clerical establishment has disintegrated as quickly and as dramatically and as uh, comprehensively as it has in Ireland. The clerical abuse scandal is far from ended and it goes to the very top of the Catholic Church in Ireland. I am 100% certain, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind, I give him the names and addresses of those children. You know that children were abused because you failed, in part because you failed to protect them. No, I, I did what I was there to do. The Irish Catholic Church once had unquestioned authority, not anymore. It came in about two or three years where the entire business of the church's power over our lives in the Republic of Ireland simply went down and stayed down and, 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 it, and it looks as though it cannot rise. The official end of Holy Roman Catholic Ireland came last summer with an extraordinary speech by the Irish Prime Minister. The rape and the torture of children were downplayed or managed to uphold instead the primacy of the institution, its power, its standing and its reputation. That landmark speech from a leader rooted in rural Catholic Ireland drew on the anger and frustration of the Irish public. I'm in Donegal, in the very northwest of Ireland. It has the highest rate of allegations of clerical abuse in the country. The church is set to publish its own report about abuse here in the local Rafo diocese. It hopes it will help to restore its reputation. Convicted rapist Father Eugene Green attacked children here and in other parts of the county for decades, often in the most remote and beautiful places. It's known the rapist was reported to his superiors many years ago, but until now, bishops have insisted there is no evidence of this. No one knows more about Father Eugene Green and how the church handled him than retired detective Martin Ridge. He spent two years investigating the crimes of Ireland's most prolific child rapist. We're crossing to Inishboffin Island, a mile off the Donegal coast. No place was safe for children here. The most beautiful, idyllic place you could imagine to live, where innocence collided with evil. It seemed that the wolves were protected and the innocence of children, the little lambs weren't. I don't believe a week went by in West Donegal where you hadn't a child or number of children sexually abused. It's horrendous. Anywhere you look around here, which is so hard to fathom, by roads, side roads, in churches, schools, the abuse here was something unbelievable, unbelievable. And the fact that nobody in the public spoke out about this, you know, after the total carnage here. There's a little compartment just behind here, Dara, just behind this very altar, which was set up 
in the event of a priest being stuck on the island due to bad weather, you know? And unfortunately, Father Eugene Green led some very young boys up here and abused them, raped them horrifically, just behind this altar here, behind the wall, basically. Of course, he was abused time and time again, the same boy, but some of the abuse happened here. The police investigation, which ended with Father Eugene Green being jailed in 2000, found evidence the priest's crimes were covered up, something always denied by the church, which says there's no documentary proof. What do you expect from the Rafo report in a couple of days' time? Any revelations? Well, it's hard to see. I mean, the review itself will show what was on files, what was written down. Will it be enough to convince us that all the truth is written down? I don't know. I don't like to be a cynic like St Thomas, but uh, uh, I only know too well how hard it is to get to the truth in the Catholic Church. I know that much remains hidden here because I used to call this place home. 14 years ago, I gave up my job as a BBC reporter and moved with family to a new life running a pub restaurant. Now, Dara, back to the old haunt again. Well, Do you think there's any change since you left? Change now, no? Most of Father Eugene Green's 26 known victims come from Goethe Herk, where I lived. Until the police inquiry began, they suffered in silence. One of them worked with me, Martin Gallagher. This shows exactly where Green served his time. And Martin shows me the various parishes Father Eugene Green worked and abused in. He believes the priest was moved every time rumours of abuse surfaced. He served there and Gidor here and went to, where were we, Glentis. Down, down here, here yeah. all the way down, down the way there. Yeah. And he served in Tory Island under Gutta Hark, Tory Island, and in Ishboffin. And then he finished up in Kilmacreen, as far as the last post was. They're moving this priest. It's like spreading a disease from one corner to another. The bishop spread the disease. He had the disease, they spread it. As simple as ABC. With the Donegal Church report imminent, Martin has just now started to speak publicly about his abuse. It began when the 12-year-old was encouraged to drive the priest's car. He started groping me when I was driving and messing about. My hands were on the wheel and at that age you were nervous probably at driving and excited and all that and you kept your hands on the wheel regardless and he would carry on with messing. He would stop and change. He would drive and expect the same treatment back from me that I was, he was giving me. Like, I couldn't do that. Like, he was forcing me to do it. Scary, like, really scary, because a 12 year old, he were very innocent, very, how would you say, stupid or whatever. You didn't know any better, like, and it's just stuff. Did he ever say anything to you about, this is our secret? Yeah, he would. I'm saying, it's not better. Um, you know, people looking at this just don't understand the devastation, the hurt, the harm that that man did. I don't know whether people will ever understand. The hurt he's caused, the lives he's ruined. The 
lives that have been lost because of them that could have been prevented, like if people had to take an action. When he was with you, did he ever mention God? Did he ever? No, no. God was the last thing in his mind. He didn't care about God. John McAteer, editor of the local Tyrconnell Tribune, Donegal born and bred. The church he knew was too powerful beyond reproach. John, what about the, the culture of silence that was here? I mean, does that culture of silence still exist? The culture of silence, I think, is, is, a, is a misnomer to a great extent because of the power and the strength of the hierarchy over the centuries and over the years here in a very rural conservative diocese like Raffo. There was a culture of fear fear that if you reported that you were being abused, you would probably be further abused by your parents for making the allegation. It was a very, very serious situation. And I think that that is ingrained into the psyche of the people here in this diocese. And maybe to an extent, that, uh, that whole history is there to this very day. You don't think it's gone? I don't think it's gone, no. Because there's a denial there. And there remains a denial to this very day that to criticise the church is entirely wrong. That deference is fading, but it is almost impossible to overstate the power the Catholic Church once had. For generations, the church influenced most aspects of Irish life. Dublin and the Eucharistic Congress of 1932. The Catholic Church was presiding like a new monarchy over the fledgling Irish state, exalted and respected and feared too. Author Colm Tobin grew up Catholic in a country town. He's long scrutinised the relationship between the Irish and the institutional church. Southern Ireland w was effectively, after 1922, a Catholic state for a Catholic people. The church was an effective government or shadow government, making it absolutely clear to government that they would control schools, um, hospitals and many other areas of public morality. Anyone who didn't like this, there was only one place to go and that was out. And people, uh, some people went out looking for work, other people went out looking for freedom. But th that was a great release, giving the church further power over those who remained. And there was a nobility and grandeur about them. I mean, the bishop lived in a palace, but even in the towns, the priest's house was often, or in villages, the biggest house, and the curate had a separate house, and they had housekeepers. So there was a sense of their grandeur. They almost replaced landlords, or were a shadow system in the way in which they functioned, uh, and the um, sense of their distance and grandeur and importance. Maynooth College was once the world's largest seminary. Thousands of priests left here to work across the globe. My own uncle, Father Noel, among them. That production line is almost closed. Fewer than a dozen priests are expected to be ordained this year. The class photo of 2007 showed just four graduating priests. Contrast that with the class of 1954. This is my uncle, Father Noel McIntyre, as you see up here, Nullag McIntyre in the Irish. A decent man, very important to me growing up. Good man, the sort of traditional Irish Catholic parish priest that every community deserved, didn't always get, but he's a good man. 
You have a sense, don't you, of just an entirely different Ireland looking at this. All these men, you know, 60, 70 men, proudly marching to work for God. But that was a different Ireland. And of course, a different church. That's the point.